so when everybody is in Yeah, you can start if you want. Sounds good. Hi, everybody. What's up, everybody? Looks like some are still connecting. There we go. Rita, I have the same last name as you. I don't think we're, I don't know you. <laughs> Distantly related, perhaps. No, you. She came first, so I just went back to check the name. Like, who is going to? Be <laughs> <laughs> That's funny. Um, hi, everybody. Uh, do you want me to get stuck going? Yeah, you can. Yeah. Okay. Um, hi, everyone. My name is Brianne Sampson. Um, I've been asked to come today. It's nice to meet all of you. Um, I work at Community Living DC. Um, I'll share some slides in a moment, but I just wanted to introduce myself first. I see all of you coming on. I'm also sharing. Just let me know if you have any questions as we go through. Uh, I'm just going to go over the sort of high level supports and services that Community Living BC has to offer. And we'll answer your questions as best I can. And if I can't answer them, I'll try and connect you with someone who can. So let me just share my screen and we can get going. <clears throat> Okay. So as I mentioned, my name is Brianne Sampson. My pronouns are she and her. Thank you for having me today. Uh, my title right now is the Manager of Services and Community Development for Health at CLBC. So my, um, in addition to sort of, um, I don't work in the regional offices. If any of you have ever touched base with CLBC, um, that my role is not in a regional office. I am available to those offices to support them and some of the work they do and where there's sort of crossover with health related. Um, <clears throat> so before we get going, I just wanted to acknowledge with gratitude that I live and work and continue to learn on the traditional and unceded territories of the Coast Salish peoples, which are the Musqueam, and Squamish and Tsleil-Waututh First Nations. This is an image that I took in one of my most favorite places I live colonially in, in Vancouver. Um, and this is a forest out, if you've ever been out by UBC, it's just a, it's a beautiful rainforest. I love going there. Um, I just really liked this image of the sun shining through. Not, it's not sun shining today though, that's for sure. It's rainy. <laughs> so today I'm going to go over with you just three things. One being who CLBC supports. Um, the second being high, it's just the eligibility process. And the third being supports, more specific supports that CLBC funds. <clears throat> Just a quick overview, this is very brief, on the disability rights, um, the history of it. So people, unfortunately, who had the label of developmental disability and intellectual disability did also experience institutionalization from in the 1800s into the 1900s. Um, there were several institutions, one of the bigger ones being called Woodlands, which is located or was located, it's not there anymore in New Westminster. Um, in 1950, there was about 1400 people at that one particular institution. Um, luckily, as the rights improved for people with disabilities, those institutions were closed. Uh, people are now a part of community, which is really important. Um, so in 1996, BC actually was the first province to begin closing institutions. Um, and then uh, a lot happened between 1996 and 2005. But in 2005, that's when Community Living British Columbia, so the organization that I work for, was established. And it really did come out of a sort of a grassroots movement from a lot of families really pushing for change and siblings pushing for change for their loved ones with an intellectual development disability. So we're happy to say that people are in community now. So who CLBC supports? So CLBC is called a Crown Corporation. Um, we receive 
all of our funding from the Ministry of Social Development and Poverty Reduction, but we have our own um, board and we, we uh, manage our own budget. Um, so CLBC supports people who are 19 throughout their lifespan. So MCFD supports children with developmental and intellectual disabilities. And then if someone turns 19, they might switch into the CLBC services. Um, we support people specifically who have the diagnosis of a developmental disability. Um, that is called our developmental disabilities stream of funding. Or we also have um, another stream of con funding called the Personal Supports Initiative, PSI. Um, and in that stream of funding, people who might have the label of autism spectrum disorder or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder, as well as significant challenges in their adaptive functioning, might also, also qualify for that PSI stream of service. Um, those people may not necessarily have an intellectual disability, but they do have significant challenges in functioning. So CLBC supports as many people as it can with the funding that's received. Some of the really, really, the, the values of CLBC include connecting people to community, uh, connecting people to funded services, uh, um, and acknowledging that sometimes it takes some time to find the right supports for people to live good lives. It doesn't just happen. Sometimes if someone needs a particular supported living arrangement, it may not be the first one that's the right fit. And sometimes it takes some time to find that. Just let me know. I can't always see if someone has a question, so please interrupt me if you do have one. So CLBC supports people throughout the whole province. Um, we have five regions that we tend to break it up into, kind of like what the health authorities do. So we have Vancouver Island, the greater Vancouver area, the South Fraser region, Southern Interior, and then North Thompson Caribbean. So we just break it up that way, it just makes it a bit easier in the way that we deliver services and the way that our offices and our, our staff are structured. Um, but really, services are available to anybody throughout the province, no matter where you live. So one of the big things that's important to CLBC is called the Community Living Authority Act. So this is a law, and it describes really what CLBC's role is. Um, it's publicly available you, and you can look at, but this is what really made CLBC, we have legislation and mandates that we have to follow and it really is based on this act. Um, similar to like what a health service would do, they have acts that they have to follow. So this is the main one that CLBC follows. There might be a couple more that intersect with our work, but this is the, the one that a lot of the work we do is based on. <clears throat> Excuse me. So eligibility criteria. So again, this is all outlined in that act that I just mentioned. So to be um, to qualify for the developmental disabilities stream of funding, um, it's a very um, so somewhat detailed assessment process. Um, you need to have the diagnosis from the DSM-5 criteria for having an intellectual disability. Uh, which includes impaired intellectual functioning and adaptive functioning, and it has to have started before the age of 18. A psychologist um, would be the person that would assess and, and uh, decide if the criteria is met for this. Um, so school psychologists do this a fair amount when someone is under 18, or a clinical psychologist might also do it. Um, this personal supports initiative is um, what I mentioned before. So. To qualify for that, you have to have the diagnosis of autism or fetal alcohol spectrum disorder. You also have to have three standard deviations below in terms of your adaptive functioning. So that is another thing that a psychologist can also assess for that. So that's the way that people become eligible for CLBC services. I'm just seeing your question, Pat. Are there are there any guidelines for newcomers to participate in your program and services? Yeah, that's a good question. So I'll actually touch on that in a little bit, and then I can give you some direction with 
sort of where to start, I guess, to, to explore that. For sure, there is definitely, if a newcomer fits this criteria, there are ways to access these services. Thank you for asking that. Just give me a second, I'll get there. Um, so as I mentioned before, for the developmental disability stream, often the documentation comes from a registered psychologist, usually a school, school psychologist. So the assessment needs to meet the criteria and then CLBC has an assessment form that the psychologist would fill out. And a lot of the psychologists throughout BC are very, the, particularly the, BC, or the school psychologists are quite familiar with what that process is with respect to getting access to CLBC services. So, and then for the PSI stream, it's sort of a similar process. Uh, there's a eligibility form, um, and then there's an adaptive assessment that also needs to be completed as well as documentation confirming the diagnosis. So similar, again, the psychologist would do that. So this is, so related to older applications and this would include newcomers. Um, so there are definitely challenges. What can be helpful is what we need to do is confirm that um, the challenges existed before someone was 18. Uh, so any documentation that's available is helpful as you enter into a process that's like this or any assessments that might have been done prior to some of the 18 school records can be really useful if any of that is available. Uh, and then what would happen is you can call and there's some slides further on in this. Um, you can call CLDC and they can help you get started if you think that you have someone um, that might be eligible for these services when you're a newcomer. So what's really important to understand about CLBC services is that these supports are voluntary. Um, so it really is the person who is eligible for the service has to consent to the service or their legal guardian or their committee or their representative also needs to consent to it. Um, just because someone's eligible for services doesn't mean that they're accessing services. And we get that quite a bit, actually. Someone might have been eligible when they turned 19 and they just feel like they didn't want to use their service and maybe 20 years later, they might decide that there's a time in their life when they might need a bit more support from CLBC. Um, but it doesn't mean that you need to use services just because you meet the criteria for CLBC. So there's different supports funded by CLBC, and this is all available on the, the website if you want more information. Um, the really kind of high level ways that we support people are ways to participate in your community ways to live in your home, and then supports for you and your family's well-being. I'll describe these in a little bit more detail in these next slides. So to participate in your community, the three sort of areas that we talk about are employment. So we have, we have ways that we can support um, different providers throughout the province to help someone access employment services. Life-based services, which is a just an acronym that stands for learning, inclusion, friendship, and employment. Um, it's just a way of accessing services that sort of meant to be wrapped around and touch all the important parts of someone's life, and they, it's very self-directed. And then community inclusion, and community inclusion, excuse me. So those are ways that someone might um, be supported to engage in their community, whatever that looks like, and is important for them. So supports to live in your home. So this can include things like independent living, shared living, which might be another term that you might hear people use is called home share. So this is a similar, this is the same thing. So shared living is living with someone else in their home. And then staffed living, which we used to call um, something probably like a group home. You've probably heard that word before. So group homes would fall under staff living. So there's lots of different ways that people might be supported by CLBC's funded services. Um, those are the three high level ways. And then the final area where supports are provided through CLBC is supports for you and for your family's well-being. So individual and family wellness support, we used to call that respite. That's one way that someone might access additional CLBC services. Sometimes we can use supports 
that are particularly like, specific to communication and behavioral support needs, especially behavioral support needs are common. Homemaker support, and then support coordination. So those are additional ways that CLBC might support someone to be able to live their full life in community. So going back to the initial question, if you're not sure where to start, your main contact would be a CLBC facilitator for eligibility. So depending on where you live in the province, um, I think I have it on the next slide. So yeah. So depending on where you live in the province, if you go to our website, you can type in your postal code or your address, and this um, particular part of the website will um, direct you to who, where you can start to see if, if you might be able to access service for yourself or for your loved one. Hopefully that answers your question to start with. It is a bit of a process, just to warn everybody, there is a lot of forms and things to fill out, but it's important to it, it's, it's important part potentially to support someone that you love. And I think that's all. That's my very high level overview. So let me stop sharing and I'm happy to answer any questions that you have. Okay. Is there any questions? Nope. Just look in the chat here. All right. Does mental health, such as anxiety or PTSD, those who demonstrate antisocial traits fall under this? What about someone who has some challenges with mobility or physical birth defects, scoliosis, mobility, or dexterity? Yeah. So there, for sure, people who have the diagnosis of intellectual and developmental disability can also have what we call con like co-occurring or um, dual diagnosis. There's lots of terms, and it can, can include mental health. Uh, diagnosis like those that you've listed, just similar to anybody else in the population. Um, so it doesn't necessarily mean it's not, wouldn't be only mental health challenges, but if someone has that diagnosis of developmental disability, they can certainly also experience and they do experience uh, mental health challenges. Um, in terms of the other things that you're talking about related to physical birth defects, um, someone has to have the intellectual disability component. So we definitely support people who have lots of um, physical support needs, no doubt about that, but they just have to meet the criteria for the development of disability and intellectual disabilities. Um, entitlement for newcomers. I'm actually not sure what you're meaning by that, Pat. I'm not sure if you can elaborate um, on how that works. I might not be able to answer that one, <laughs> but I'm happy to, if you can elaborate, Let's see if I know. Sorry, should oh, I, there you uh, are. Should I just talk? Yeah, go ahead. Hi. Yeah, um, yeah, we're with Mosaic and uh, oh, okay. we have the Accessibilities for Newcomers program here. And we do have some clients that uh, have developmental and intellectual disabilities. So um, again, further to that first question, uh, just wondering about um what the uh the process would criteria be. would be yeah. and what the status for eligibility around sure. uh, newcomers yeah so the, the best thing to do would be depending on where um they're residing in that when you sort of first encounter the process if you, you know what i'll put it in the chat let me find it here um if you connect with um the eligibility facilitator they're the ones that would best direct all of those questions for you. Let me just pull it out. I think I have it connected in my computer. Uh, but yeah, good question. Let me try to find it. I, can't, I can always send it out for sharing. Oh, here it is. I think. Yes. Okay. Put it in the chat. Is there any other questions? Okay. okay.
Well, if there's no questions, then everyone can go enjoy some lunch. I'll just use the last few minutes that you have just to ask oh, yeah. a, a bit more question. So just yeah, um, to, to get a little bit more clarity around that. So the idea then is to contact the eligibility. Yeah. What was the name so of the person? That... Eligibility here. So, be, so it's an eligibility facilitator. I'll step up to the chat. Um, so because it'll be based on location in the province. Okay. Okay. What you want to do is if you go to that link I posted and put in where you're located or where the person's located, um, it will direct you to which office to start with, basically. And when you call, you can just ask for that person and describe uh, if you're supporting a newcomer, that's fine. So just describe, you know, we have a newcomer and curious about what needs to be done to seek eligibility for CLBC, and they will help you. With that. And there's no set criteria, like whether a person has to be a permanent resident or anything that's kind of in your guidelines oh, at all? That's a good question. I don't know if I know the answer to that. Um, I don't know, but they'll be able to tell you that. They, they'll know. Okay. Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> yeah, that, no, that's fair enough. We'll, we'll get in touch then. Thank you. Yeah. And um, just from your perspective, is there um, any issues or concerns around uh, second languages and being able to communicate um, with your clients that may not speak English as their first language? I mean, we have, um, depending on where we're at, there are services that we can access. A lot of what we do is supporting someone to access, like we do, basically we fund the service to providers throughout the province, right? So. When we're talking about the direct service to the person, um, that would also be a consideration I, as, you know, we're, you work through what services that person might be looking for. Um, certainly a piece to this, definitely. I mean, we serve people throughout the province, so we have lots of different um, languages. Um, and sometimes we have, depending on the office, sometimes there's people there who might speak the particular language that someone needs, or we can look into getting... Um, language um, interpreters. Great. So um, there's no problem then providing services to people that speak other languages. No. Great. Okay. That's really good to know. Thank you so much, Brian. No problem. Okay. I think you had a question. All right. Yeah. Oh, good. In the chat? Is that what you Many children with disabilities are mislabeled and being categorized as mentally. There's someone who said I was born with all oh, every hearing and such delayed your learning. Yeah. Oh yeah. It, it's hard. We I mean, I think that we've come a long way from what you're describing, but there is definitely a history, and not a good history, of a lot of the experiences that people have had related to different disabilities and not necessarily like like you're talking about having a hearing impairment and people assuming that you didn't understand what was going on. I'm sorry that that was your experience. Oh, we can't. I don't, I think you're talking. We can't hear you though. Uh, to uh, bring awareness is always important. Yeah. I got involved with Inclusion BC the yeah. past summer. Uh, Kelowna, yeah. and uh, I learned a lot. Um, there was a time in my life where I was threatened in a foster care system at one home where they were going to put me in Riverview, oh. Woodland. Uh, it was in the 70s. Yeah. Um, because back then, like they figured uh, any kids that were born with any kind of birth defects or not were better off to be segregated away. And that's yeah. why I mentioned about the 1960s. Thank you for um, bringing that forward. And I'm glad that you were connected with Inclusion BC. They do a lot of really great work. Are you talking about the Self-Advocate Leadership Institute? Is that what mm -hmm. you went to? In yeah. Canada? Yeah, that's great. I work with a lot yeah. of self-advocates connected to that. Um, and it's important. It's We have a lot of really strong self-advocate networks and societies throughout BC, which is really important, which led to a lot of the changes that we've had since the 60s, thankfully that's happened. Uh, so it's important that, I think it's great that you're involved in those advocacy 
networks. Yeah, and we need people like us who are advocates, yeah. not just for themselves, but for the disability population as a whole, you know. Um, and this is why I got involved is because I was a support worker in the downtown east side oh, with wow. uh, the most marginalized folks dealing with addiction and so forth. And I uh, had to leave the job, sadly, because I was also being uh, treated with biased attitudes by the new management of the organization. So I decided to go more into the disability movement, which I think had been my passion. Um, growing up and understanding, um, many of the people I know, some of them are still alive, who um, had demonstrated miraculous stuff in their lives, you know, amazing. Yeah. And yeah, and I think we need to be uh, well acknowledged and continue to bring awareness, like the strength of our folks, whether your intellectual, developmental, or any kind of physical birth yeah. defects. My birth defects is a result of the water contamination in no. northern Manitoba. No. And people don't talk about these things. They yeah. rather have doctors diagnose you all kinds of things without really actually, like, what is the cause of birth defect? Yeah. Instead of thinking, well, look at the land, look at what you're doing to them. You're disrupting, you're uh, pouring chemicals on, so forth. But all that needs to be taken in consideration for people yeah. that were born with multiple birth defects, especially the ones that are physically, physically disabled. And I, um, and, yeah. I think that you are working in this sector and bringing your lived experience is so important to those that you're helping and for me to hear, like it's important that we continue to share these stories because there are a lot of stories. Uh, so thank you for doing that. I think it's really important to help people with this journey, particularly yourself. Thank you. Um, okay. Well, I think um, I think that's it for today, but thank you for all your really great questions. Can I jump in with one more question? Yeah, of course. Um, Sandra, I really appreciate you sharing your experiences with us and, yeah. uh, and Miigwech to you also. And uh, as uh, uh, can I ask, are you a member of an Indigenous community? Uh, I'm a Métis, Cree Métis. Yeah. So um, as you know, the Métis is kind of like, kind of um, put aside by the First Nation community, but I do have Simshian children, they're all adults. Right. And so I'm very much a part of the BC um, Indigenous community, uh, but I live in Burnaby. And uh, Brianna, could I ask if there are uh, specialized services and supports for the Indigenous community, if there's anything you can um, highlight there? Go ahead, Sandra. Yeah. Uh, there's BCAN, BC Aboriginal Network yeah, Disability and Society, and they are on the island. So that's yep. one. That's a good organization. And then I'm a part of, a, I'm also part of the larger level in uh, Ontario called Don Canada. And we have a Indigenous um, disability rep, and I'm one of those feminist reps. So Thanks, we, we are yeah. work. We yeah. are slowly putting things together. And also, yeah. if you go through the Jordan Principle, they also yeah. have services too for yeah. children Jordan, with special needs. I was gonna say Jordan's yeah. principle is for for, but yeah, it's an important one. It's for children. Mm -hmm. um, Pat, we have so yeah, we have lots of um, people who access our services who have who are Indigenous. Um, we have we're we're in the process. I would say we have a specific Indigenous relations team, and they are working on both working with service providers who aren't Indigenous, but making their services culturally safe. And then we are also working on procuring with specific Indigenous providers. So there's a bit of both. It depends where you are in the province, I would say, um, in terms of what services are available, but it's certainly something that's um, 
a really important part of the services that CLBC offers, ensuring that there's culturally safe services. Yeah, it'd be great if you could pull those resources together on your website to um, yeah. allow easier access. Okay. I just added oh. the Disability uh, Indigenous Disability yeah, Network, you. which Thank is a good one that. too, but I'm sure, I, Sandra, I wasn't able to make note of all of the great organizations that you mentioned, but I'd really love to, uh, you know, be aware of that if, if you're able to share it and, and perhaps follow up with us at, at some later date. Yeah, we have ESANs in the chat, Sandra, but I think you mentioned a, a national one that you're involved with. Oh, there, was it Dawn? Dawn. Oh, okay. Let me see if I can find Dawn Canada. Yeah. It's great. The BC Metis Federation has a special, um, you have to be a member in order to get yeah. any kind of like medical services support. That's right. So uh, look into that. Uh, like, as you know, we are under the recognizable act, uh, Indigenous, and there are services available in any organization. If it's not available, then it needs to be questioned upon about that because that's part of human rights, part of truth and reconciliation as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And so I'm also part of another group called the Hummingbird Collision, which is known as the um, Disability uh, Canadian, the Canadian Disability Feminine Coalition now been converted to the Hummingbird Coalition, and that's in Ontario, part of Gone Canada. So it's quite a bit there. We're, we're all like advocates, we're all activists, we're all like being the voice for the folks uh, with disability. And I'm part of women's uh, disability movement. So yeah, like since I left my job back in January, I just really took me a while to get out of my depression because I also suffer from PTSD mm. and depression. And also it took me a few months and then I got into the disability movement and I just been on the roll ever since. Sounds like yeah. <laughs> Thank you. Yeah, well, we thank you work. for letting me share. I don't mean to oh, uh, uh, take over for you, Brianna. Brianna. Oh, no problem. Pat, um, I added in the chat um, a bit more information about Indigenous related services, just for your information um, that's available. Thank you, Sandra. Thank you for all of your, thank you for sharing. It's important that we hear about that. It's, a vulner it's very vulnerable to share your story. So thank you. All right, everyone. I think I think we'll say goodbye now. It's nice, it's nice to spend this time with all of you. Okay. It was very nice. See you guys next time. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Take Good care, everybody.